Hello, everyone. This is Tom Still from the Wisconsin Technology Council, and thank you for joining us today in uh, the latest installment of our Crossing the Coronavirus Chasm. AI and end to work as we know it, and uh, there's certainly been a lot of changes in in the work world and, and everything else uh, throughout the, the course of the COVID-19 epidemic, and we've tried to follow that in a variety of ways and give you different perspectives that can help you out as you conduct your own businesses and just your, your life in general. Uh, we're thrilled today to have Nick Myers uh, from Red Fox AI, and uh, I'll tell you more about him in a few minutes. Um, and so he's going to have, I think, what's going to be a highly engaging uh, presentation around this. And uh, I also want to introduce Jim Hartlieb from First Business Bank. Uh, Jim and First Business. Uh, they really do a lot to work with young companies and, and primarily small businesses. And uh, I've been thrilled to, to work with them on different occasions as, as we moved ahead. So welcome, Jim. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for allowing us to, to sponsor today. And like you said, we've been a long-term supporter of the tech early stage community in part because we were one ourselves. The bank was started in Madison in 1990 as a startup. And so we've always kind of had that as part of our roots. Um, now we're a $2 billion bank that serves the communities in Madison, Milwaukee, Fox Valley, and Kansas City with traditional lending, SBA, factoring, trust and investment, kind of the full suite of services. And uh, we've been located in the University Research Park for our entire lives too. So there's there's a lot of crossover. Our, our board of directors, Jan Eddy and Ralph Cowton, who are some legendary tech names that you'll recognize have been on our board of directors, you know, since the beginning. And Tom still sits on our advisory board now. So it's always been really important to us. Uh, we have industri industry practice groups and one of them is high tech. So uh, this is a really good fit for us and we're just appreciative to be able to be a part of it. So thanks for having me, Tom. Oh, absolutely, Jim. Yeah, thanks for all you and your team are doing. So, well, great to have you. All right. Well, on to Nick. And uh, so pleased to have Nick. He uh, He's the founder and CEO of Red Fox. And um, he's really well steeped around voice technologies. You know, how do you how do you lever things like Alexa and Google Assistant and, and a variety of other pieces that are out there now? He's uh, been a TEDx speaker. Uh, by the way, he's a Wisconsin native and uh, educated at UW Stevens Point, and so uh, he's uh, he's well well uh, versed in the state as well. So he's been featured in a bunch of different publications, um, uh, some you know some awards over time in terms of you know his his uh, work as a young entrepreneur and uh, pod, podcast uh, broadcaster of uh, some renown, and so. Nick, thank you so much for joining us, and we really hope to learn from this today. And for the for the folks who are online, we want to make sure that um, you have a chance to to ask questions of Nick as we move ahead. So just do that through the through the chat function, and I'll try to congregate them or or otherwise uh, collate them and and get them on. So thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank you, Tom. It's an absolute pleasure to be here as always. And, you know, I'm, I'm just, I, I can't be more grateful for all the support that, you know, you and everybody else at the Tech Council has, has given me personally and, and has given us over the, the past year. It's been great being able to work alongside you guys. And um, this is truly a, an amazing, an amazing organization that, that Wisconsin has. And I know everybody, of course, who's on this call uh, already may know that, but I, I just want to echo that because the work you guys do is so important, to, especially in a state like Wisconsin. Uh, but I'm very excited to be here this afternoon to give one of my favorite talks, Artificial Intelligence and then to Work as We Know It. Um, this is one that I, I continually work on and have had to update so much, probably within the last two and a half years I've been giving it specifically now that we are in the midst of the 100-year pandemic, uh, COVID-19. But of course, a lot has changed in the last you know few months here, but I've been talking a lot about 
over the past couple of years, some of the things that we're already experiencing, like remote work and increased automation. And it's just funny that I've, I've already been kind of talking about some of these things specifically with this talk, and then they finally are actually happening, which is, is pretty interesting to see. But um, this is one of my favorite talks, and I hope you leave this webinar today with some additional information as to why work as we know it is going to change in the age of AI. There we go. All right. So let's kick things off here. And what you see here, well, nope. what you see here, as we know, is our lovely planet Earth. But there's, there's something different about the planet Earth that we're looking at in this slide. This is planet Earth in 2019. Uh, not so much different from the Earth that we're living in now, except that there isn't a whole set of circumstances that are new and, and are affecting our very way of life, unlike they currently are in 2020 on this picture of Earth in 2019 that we're currently looking at. And I think it's important to note that it's really interesting how quickly things that we have come to know for so long can change just like that. And I think we're all really starting to finally let that sink in now and adjust to what I will like to call the next normal. And I'll be talking a bit about that as we move through the presentation. But things have changed. And specifically, our world of work has changed from this planet Earth that we see in 2019. So what you see here, this is the office space in 2019. I think we're all very familiar with this open office concept plan, everybody kind of hovering around one another's desks, there's collaboration in an office and you know, lunchtime approaches, you grab a couple of people, you walk down to your local restaurant and this is work as we've known it for decades, right? This, this is the walled office space. Well, that walled office space has changed and this is our new office space. Yes, so that's exactly, so we're hoping so. And it's a learning process. So now we're moving to this new approach of, of these, um, you know, lock, local lockdowns. It's part of the learning process to really understand how this is happening. Now, quite honestly, this should have happened a long time ago, in my opinion. But here we are in this situation. And so, you know, how can we improve? <laughs> so what's really funny about this is she was actually being interviewed on the BBC. And her daughter decided to come into the room and choose a new spot for the picture. And I think a lot of people, maybe even some of you attending this webinar today, have had the pleasure of experiencing being in an important meeting or just trying to grind through some work and you also now have to tend to your children. Um, so our office space has changed drastically and anywhere you look around the world, this is the new office space. Now, what is this? This is a meeting. So everybody gathered around a table, of course, meeting spaces have looked different over the years, but in 2019, this was our meeting space. Everybody sitting around a table, collaborating, coffee in hand, notepads in hand, talking about the latest quarterly sales numbers, how to improve revenue, you know, typical things that we've done for decades. Well, this is the new weekly meeting. Goodbye. All right. Talk to you guys Bye. soon. Bye. See you guys. <laughs> Daddy! Daddy! Can you hear us? The new weekly meeting, digitally, of course, where anything can happen and everything is unpredictable. And I mean, look at us right now. We're sitting in one of the same exact scenarios here. Clearly, I'm not going to get up and walk away in my underpants, but this has happened to a lot of people. And again, this is the new way we conduct meetings. Oh. Conferences. So, you know, all of us, 2019 and many, many years before that, the conference was always the same. Big event center, smaller depending on where you went, packed house, keynote, thousands of people. Well, in 2020, this is the new conference. Again, a perfect example of what we're doing right now, all tucked away in our home offices on Zoom or another webinar platform, 
coffee or another beverage in hand, learning the best we can in a completely different setting. So it's at the end of the day, the world has changed and the old normal that we once lived in no longer applies. I, I think we all at this point, I think, know and, and hopefully are starting to accept that. And in this new world, technology has, has assimilated itself into our lives more than it ever has before in ways that we may not have even recognized, but we now rely more on our technology than ever before. You know, I, I tend to think about, imagine if something like this pandemic happened 30, even 20 years ago, where we didn't have the internet speeds that we have now, we didn't have the connectivity, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have uh, good video chatting platforms. I mean, it's, it's truly incredible how much we have very quickly shifted our reliance to these different technologies. And really what we once took for granted, I don't think will ever be the same. And I don't try to scare you when I say that, but it's something important to accept as we look ahead at what's next, what's in this next normal. And I think the first step is realizing that what we did have will never be the same and not necessarily in a bad way either. But the door has been open for immense technological growth because of the pandemic. And this was going to happen regardless, but there's a lot of new reports coming out for some very smart folks, way more intelligent than me, who are predicting that we're going to see technology grow and expand across all sectors by 100x compared to the last 10 years. So the 2020s are truly going to be an era of technological growth, in part because of the pressure that the pandemic is now putting on that to happen. And I would just like everybody to know as well, this change, this change where technology drives everything, distributed workforce, automation, taking jobs and replacing them with new jobs, this change was inevitable. This was going to happen regardless. And in fact, many companies were already looking at doing this, but it was actually supposed to be drawn out over the course of 15 to 20 years. In our case, it got condensed into about two months. So that is why you are noticing more so the pressure and the stress that this condensing of the old way of doing things to our new technological future is having because it happened so quickly. Now, the era of AI has begun, truly. And AI has already experienced massive growth in the 2010s, in part due to the Internet of Things, cloud computing and advancements in data storage and computer memory. All that contributes to the growth of artificial intelligence as we know it today. But in the light of the COVID-19 pandemic, the 2020s will really be AI's renaissance if you will. And, and we've already been in a new gilded age, but this is going to be a gilded age powered by artificial intelligence. And truthfully, a technology explosion, unlike anything that we've experienced to date on this planet. And more companies and business leaders are investigating and investing in new technologies and artificial intelligence for good reason. I mean, if you look at robotics alone, there were already some companies aside from Amazon who did warehousing that we're looking at onboarding the use of robotics and robots to help aid that process. Because if you look at a robot versus a human process, a robot doesn't need sleep, a robot doesn't have to eat, and a robot doesn't get sick. So that's been expedited greatly. Not to mention just generalized process automation where different things specifically in the finance sector were already being offloaded onto various AI powered programs that could predict stock market fluctuations and investments better than a human being could. So this was again already happening, but in this new era of AI we're entering to, it's gonna be at the front of everything that we do. And aside from business, more consumers are embracing artificial intelligence in ways that they don't even realize, specifically technologies like voice assistants that are AI powered to help make their lives easier in the post pandemic world. And we're already starting to see that there's been a lot of new research that's come about in the past four months showcasing how many more consumers are embracing their digital voice assistants to accomplish goals versus the old way of doing things where you may have had to be in contact with somebody else. And like I alluded to earlier, the world as we once knew it will never again be the same. And again, I, I do not truly mean to strike fear when I say that, but that is just the reality of where we're at and where we're going. 
And the faster that we accept that and begin to look ahead and how we can adapt and improve upon things that we've been doing in this new era of AI is how we're going to succeed. So this really is the time right now in this very moment to adapt and take advantage of the countless new opportunities that are available to us because of artificial intelligence and other emerging technologies. So in this talk today, we are going to go through a couple of different things. The first is I'm going to give you a basic overview. Of what is artificial intelligence, of course, because I believe that's paramount to understanding anything that I'm going to be going over today. And this knowledge is going to help you in so many ways that you don't even yet realize, along with why does artificial intelligence matter? How artificial intelligence will change work and is changing work and what you need to do to prepare. All of these are core components of this talk and you are going to leave with a lot of information today. But I say we kick it off with what is artificial intelligence? You know, we've heard the word artificial intelligence for, you know, definitely in, in the grand scheme of everything else going on, probably within the last 10 years, it's become really popularized. But a lot of people have gotten bogged down, I find, by the buzzword. We hear AI, but we don't exactly know what it means. And, and that creates fear because when we don't understand something, we become fearful of it. So what I like to do in every single talk I give is briefly go over what exactly is AI, where are we at with it, and what does the future look like? So the only four things that you really need to know about artificial intelligence are thus. Machine learning, deep learning, along with neural networks, and natural language processing. So to go into each one of these on a very, very high level, these are the four primary components of artificial intelligence as we know it today in 2020. So machine learning is something that's been around for decades already actually, and really it's just a computer's ability to interpret data that's given to it and recognize patterns. And on a very high level, we can train computer systems to be able to formulate results out of the data sets that we give to them. So at a very high level, that is what machine learning is. Deep learning and neural networks, I'll talk about these together because they're intertwined, but a neural network is essentially, think of it as an artificial brain. How our brain communicates and reasons and understands the world around it by using neurons, of course, that are firing at every moment in time in our daily lives, we can also create that within computers now, where we have these neural networks, we call them, where we feed it a set of data and it actually reasons and interprets and understands the data by firing between different sets of neurons or nodes as they're called them in these different networks. And then what deep learning is, it's essentially a neural network, but you have all these different layers that allow you to really encapsulate human intelligence to the best point that we can now, where instead of actually having to train the AI system, the AI system trains itself based upon the data that we give to it, which is really incredible. And then the last part of that is natural language processing. And that's a computer's ability to understand what you or I say. So again, when we look at voice assistant technologies like Alexa or Google Assistant, Siri or Bixby, they essentially are powered by natural language processing. And that's how they interpret our language in order to give us results, of course, as it, it does all the really neat stuff on the back end. So where are we at with artificial intelligence in 2020? Well, a lot of people think, oh, we're close to it becoming intelligent and all powerful and it's gonna take over. No, 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 no. We are nowhere close to it being sentient and it thinking on its own at this point. And there's a lot of discussion that that may never actually happen. Do we think it can happen? Yes, anything's possible, but we don't exactly know. But what AI in 2020 can do now is one thing extremely well. It requires a lot of data to do so, but it can only do one thing that we train it to do. And that's the difference between something called narrow artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. So narrow artificial intelligence is what we can do today where we train the AI system to do one thing incredibly well with a lot of data and a lot of parameters. Artificial general intelligence is the scary HAL 9000 from 2001 A Space Odyssey that can think on its own, that can make decisions on its own and decide if it wants to off us or not. Just kidding, just kidding with that one. But that's what artificial general intelligence is. And that is what the entire AI industry is working towards to create an intelligence that either matches our own or more than likely will surpass our own. And all of this is being driven by advancements in the internet of things with all of our different devices continuously reporting data at any given time and cloud computing where we now have these massive data centers that can process all this information at, breath, at breakneck speeds 
unlike anything that we've been able to do before. So that is your, your 101 of artificial intelligence. And you are now smarter than 90% of the people that I come across. So in order to understand, I think, AI in general, of course, we need to understand the history too. And I'm just gonna dive into a brief evolution of AI. A lot of people think that AI has only been around really the past 15, 20 years. No, this stuff has actually been around since ancient times in terms of theory, but actual developments have really only been since the 40s and the 50s. So what we have here first is the golden age of sci-fi from about 1938 to 1946. And this is when science fiction, as we know it today, was really booming. Of course, we had authors like Isaac Asimov and Doc D.C. Smith writing all their different tales about robotics and computers and what that would look like in a futuristic world. You know, the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz can be considered one of the first visual depictions of an automatron, at least in film. So during the golden age of sci-fi, a lot of these ideas are really starting to mature. And then in the 1950s, or early 1950s rather, we had Alan Turing, of course, who is one of the most well-known AI mathematicians and theorists to really set the stage for a lot of what we know today when it comes to AI. And of course, he popularized the famous Turing test, which is used to test whether a machine is actually intelligent. But his 1915 paper, Can Machines Think, actually set the stage for all of this and really caused this AI explosion that began to take place in the late 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then in 1965, of course, we had Gordon Moore of Intel with Moore's Law, which basically surmises that every year or two, the amount of computing power will double. And I have news for y'all, that has happened. Every one to two years since 1965, computer power has increased, it's become cheaper, and it's become more efficient. And this is exponential growth, by the way. He predicts that this will happen until infinity. So you know, what we look at now, when we get to 2030, it'll be a million times more than what it is today, which is just absolutely mind blowing, if we hold by that principle. In 1980, we had Edward Feigenbaum, who introduced his expert systems, which was really, you know, a computer program that mimicked the decision making process of a human expert. These are really some of the, the early machine learning models. Um, and these systems were used widely in many industries. Then in 1997, we had IBM's Deep Blue defeat Gary Kasparov, who was the world chess champion. This is the first time an AI computer system, of course, could do that. And this really is what began to popularize artificial intelligence as we know it today. Then in 2009, Google actually developed the first autonomous car in the forms as we know them with their Waymo project, and it leveraged Google Street View technology to do so. And in the 2010s, we had just a boom in cloud computing, facial recognition and voice technology. So this is the history folks, and of course I've condensed this, but the big question is what's next? With everything that's happened over the last, you know, 60, 70 years, what possibly could be next? And that is the really exciting thought to have. I wish I could peer into my crystal ball and I have done that occasionally, but all I can say is expect to be talking to a lifelike artificial intelligence within the next five to 10 years is all I will say. Will it be intelligent in us? I do not know that but it will sound almost exactly like us. That I can guarantee you. So really when we look at AI, it's all about data, right? So AI as we know it today would not be here without massive amounts of data. And everything is data. Everything in our known world can be broken down into data. Every sight, sound, taste, touch, object, all of it can be viewed as a series of zeros and ones by a computer. Now, machines, of course, can process data faster than any human being ever could hope to, and they already can. To put that into a bit of a perspective for you, the human brain can complete about 38,000 trillion operations per second. That's a lot. Our brains are very efficient, very powerful. But if you look at something like the Summit supercomputer that IBM developed a few years ago, that can process 200 quadrillion operations per second. And it's interesting to note too, that Summit Supercomputer has already been used during the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccine development. So we already have technology able to process more than our own brains can. And that is just a signal of the future. So we're already being outpaced. But what does this mean for professionals across all industries? Well, we now can sift through large amounts of data at record breaking speeds. We've had data to work with for many years, but it's been so hard to actually compile and sift through all that. We can now do it with some of these AI programs. And specifically, when we look at the intelligence and analytics that have to do with sales figures and marketing, um, IT, there's so much data there 
and machines can sift through it all. They never get tired, they never get hungry, never have to take a toilet break. They can sift through it all. They can reason and give us results that helps us run our businesses more efficiently. And we are just on the tip of the iceberg of this as well. And this is truly what the value is going to be as we head into the future with data in mind. Now, data is the new oil. It truly is. Data is the most valuable thing on planet Earth at this given time. And there is a reason why these four companies I have on this slide are sitting here. Well, let's take a look at some of their values quick. Google, $1 trillion company. Facebook, $650 billion company. Apple, $1.3 trillion company. Amazon, $1.5 trillion company. Combined, these five tech companies are worth more than the total GDP of Germany and Japan, respectively. That is crazy to think that that is how wealthy, and technologically advanced these four companies are. And they are the new oil companies of the Gilded Age. You know, we look at Tim Cook, we look at Sundar Pichai, we look at Mark Zuckerberg, we look at Jeff Bezos. They are the new age Rockefellers, Carnegie's, Pullman's, and Vanderbilt's, and, and Ford's really. And everything that these companies do now, and are doing now, and have been doing for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, is paving the way for our future. And of course, we can argue on both sides on what's good and what's bad, but essentially these are the ones that are the driving force behind it all. Data is the most valuable asset on earth. The more data that you own, the more data that you can manipulate, and the more data that you can manage, that is where your value is going to be throughout the 2020s, the 2030s, the 2040s, and beyond. That is the new value. So now that we've broken that down, let's talk a bit about how work has changed. So we look at the changing nature of work, right? Where the concept of work and the spaces in which we work have changed dramatically over the last 20 years, referencing some of the slides I had earlier, how that can change in less than a year, right? So what used to be suit and tie when you went into the office has now become buttoned down in jeans and in some cases from that one video, buttoned down and boxers and cubicles and walled offices are now co-working spaces or working remotely, specifically working remotely. And that of course is not going to go away anytime soon. What used to be a steady job for 40 years with one employer is now a new employer on an average of one to three years. And the gig economy and freelancing has increased tenfold. So what the point I'm trying to make here is a lot of people think, oh, you know, work has been pretty stagnant, you know, since it's really been, you know, as we've come out of the, the, the early industrial revolution into more of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, work has been changing. It just has been a slow burn of it changing versus everything we've had to deal with over the last three months and it just being shoved right in our faces. But this stuff has been happening and I think we all can agree that we've been seeing that. And really personal computers, smartphones, and the internet have been advancing this push towards the changing nature of work. I've been saying for a very long time, and again, it's finally coming to life, that your new office space is a laptop, an internet connection, and a smartphone, and you can work anywhere. And we're seeing that happen today, of course, in light of the pandemic. But I think a really interesting thing to take notice to as well is one of the big things about the nature of work has been the value of a paycheck. Well, it's interesting to note that through these generational shifts, of course, as we look more towards early Gen X, millennials, and Gen Z, they actually do not value a paycheck as much. They value corporate citizenship and flexibility with their jobs and their lives. And I think that's only going to grow as well as we head into the next decade and beyond as companies begin to take more of a stance fueled by all this technology on very important social issues. And we're already starting to see that take place. So working from home, this is a, something that I really want to touch on quickly here. So is working from home here to stay? Well, percent of respondents who would like to change their work schedule after COVID-19 has been contained. Well, of course, as we can see here, the overwhelming majority of people surveyed 43% said so they would like to work remotely more often. 35% wants to maintain their former schedule if they could work remote. So of course, everybody's schedule has been upended because children have been home and different things. So if you can work from home, but have your former schedule, sure. Go back to the office 12%. And then of course, 8% already worked remotely full time. But this is just a snapshot, of course, conducted between April 16th and 17th of this year. I'm sure this has changed even more since then. But I think what we're seeing now with the majority of workforces becoming distributed, 
we're going to see a very drastic change in how we conduct work, how meetings are conducted. And this again is just the tip of the iceberg. There's already companies talking about how they may potentially be limiting their commercial space and maybe offering more pop-up hubs in the future, more like co-working spaces where you can just pop in for meetings and different things, but your actual office is in your home or in a remote environment. And this has been one of the biggest impacts of technology in COVID-19 or throughout the pandemic. But I think it's important to consider too that we've lost our humanity to work. And this is something that I've been thinking a lot about as I've designed this presentation in different iterations over the last couple of years. You know, contrary to popular belief, human beings were not meant to sit behind a desk for 50 years of our lives. You know, I, I'm a firm believer that when we look at the scope and purpose of, I think, what our species is meant to do, it was not meant to just sit behind a desk, work, and then pass on. That's not what we were meant to do. And I think in various ways, we have continually searched for things to limit the amount of quote unquote work that we have to do. And that's where really technology comes into play, right? Because with every new technological advancement, we have offloaded some mundane task that we really didn't need to be doing anyhow. Yes, it created a job for somebody, but there was a way to do it more efficiently, which maybe yields a different opportunity down the line. So for so long, we've been shackled to this conventional understanding of work that I think we've lost sight of what it actually means to be human beings and, and live our lives. And I think we create these technological innovations so we can experience more at the end of the day and, and offload some of this mundane stuff to be able to actually experience life as humans. Because what is the most important aspect of really our existence? Time. And especially in business, time is the most important thing. Why? because we can't create more of it. No matter what we do, no matter what we think we can do, no matter what we create, we cannot make any more time. So if we can create different pieces of technology and leverage technology to help us gain more of our time back, that is the true asset, that is the true value. And as artificial intelligence begins to onboard itself and automation begins to onboard itself into a majority of what we do, I truly don't think over the next 10, 20, 30 years, we'll have to worry about time as much as we do today. And industries are changing, right? So every industry will be impacted by artificial intelligence. If you're somebody sitting here, no matter what industry that you're in, if you're thinking to yourself, oh no, I won't be impacted by AI. Yes, you will. Every single professional no matter whether you're a gig worker or a corporate CEO, you will be affected by artificial intelligence. And again, going, drawing back to my point where the goal of AI, allowing us to put our humanity back into work and, and reduce these mind-numbing, mindless tasks is the true goal of automating so many of these different things and onboarding AI. You know, we have a large concern right now where a lot of people think AI is going to take all of our jobs automation is going to create an even greater disparity in economic, you know, the wealth gap that we've all been seeing happening here. Well, I'm here to give you some cold hard facts and I, I'm here to tell you jobs will not disappear. They are just going to change, if that makes sense. Especially when we start considering that jobs are going to be birthed out of this era of AI that we haven't even thought of yet. And I'll get into a statistic in a second here that will showcase that a bit better. But jobs are not going to disappear. They're going to change. They're going to be augmented. But new jobs that we don't even know exist yet are going to come to life before our very eyes. Now, at present, 47% of business leaders have stated that their companies have embedded at least one AI capability in their business process. And 21% say that in their organizations who that or 21% say that their organizations have embedded AI in several parts of their business. So, and this was a statistic from 2018, early 2019. So even considering now what's happened with COVID-19, I bet this has increased even more as we're looking for different ways to bring efficiency to our businesses, especially in a period of such uncertainty. And AI is important to business and enterprise. It's going to be the key to the lock of the future. And at some point, businesses will not be able to survive without it, much like how we're looking at the world of work now. It's probably hard, at least for me, of, of course, you know, my, my, my age may have to do with that, but it's hard for me even to imagine a world without the internet, without smartphones, without computers. And especially if you look at how business is conducted now, 
I mean, the world would literally be at a standstill if we did not have these technologies at our disposal. So it's hard to even imagine what life would be like without them. And that's exactly what's going to happen as AI onboards itself and automates more things. We are truthfully going through a digital transformation unlike any other. And that's, that's such a buzzword and it's been tossed around so much, but it's true. So many different industries have been trying to undergo digital transformation. Some, as the pandemic got going, had to do it in about two weeks, which is crazy. I actually did not realize until I started doing some research for this talk, how many companies did not have a cloud infrastructure? How many companies did not have VPN set up for remote work? Crazy, but they've been forced to do it now. And that's only going to show them the possibilities and, and propagate this transformation even more. And of course, you know, I think one of the big things that we're going to see a decline in, and it'll be interesting to see how this plays out is travel. You know, how many companies sent people to business meetings, you know, on a weekly basis and flow them around the country internationally? Well, now everybody's noticing, huh, maybe I can have that same meeting in the comfort of my home office or even in a, an isolated co-working space without having to travel and spend all the money. And I mean, that's going to save companies. I, I can't even imagine how much money, but that's just another byproduct of this digital transformation, right? Is things like that are going to be changing drastically. So this is affecting industries all across the board. So I'm going to dive into a couple different key industries here now, and you may be in some of these, but um, one of the big ones here is healthcare. So how is AI going to impact healthcare? How is it already impacting healthcare? Well, first of all, AI is going to be able to free up a physician's time actually by completing, completing menial tasks. I mean, physicians have to deal with so much paperwork. They have to dictate, they have to do all these things on top of actually treating people that it's hard for them to actually bring that empathy and compassion into the ER, into the doctor's office. And a lot of them have openly admitted that, but AI is going to allow them to automate some of the stuff that they don't want to do. And that's only going to increase our healthcare. You know, it's going to help discover new drugs and treatments that's already happening with COVID-19 where AI has been leveraged to do this. And it's going to change the face of healthcare and extend our lives even more. And, you know, I think we're going to see now that telehealth is beginning to finally have its awakening is we're going to have more personalized healthcare experiences with more, you know, AI programs actually conducting that chatbots, or even again, remote telehealth that can leverage some of these different technology tools to personalize that for the patient. Some examples here, a British hospital actually recently launched a virtual assistant using IBM Watson called Maisie, and it uses Watson's NLP or natural language processing to communicate with hospital employees by giving them real-time information on COVID-19. So a really good example of how this is already being done. And then again, another pandemic example, the NYU Grossman School of Medicine actually developed a predictive AI to be able to help researchers determine how sick somebody will get with COVID-19 and the severity of their illness. And it's 80% accurate. And they created that in a month. I mean, that's, that's the stuff that's available to us today. So if we take into account that that's what we can do now in terms of healthcare, what can we do in the future? There's already AI out there that Google developed that can actually read and diagnose precancerous tissue better than human beings can. Again, tip of the iceberg, but healthcare is gonna see some of the greatest transformation. Human resources is a big one. People in HR, how is that going to, to change because of AI? Well, first and foremost, business and people intelligence are only going to grow. We have so much data, especially when we look at applicants and um, cognitive ability and you know different objective tests, subjective tests that we put people through in the hiring process, we're gonna be able to deal with that data on a level untold. So we're going to have objective ranking in terms of the hiring process. We're gonna be able to remove some of the subjective criteria and bias that has existed in hiring for so long. Because even though you know, an HR professional hopefully will never admit that they have bias, we all have unconscious bias that we deal with. So if we hand off some of these different hiring processes to an AI that doesn't necessarily have bias, that's gonna create more detailed and better hiring practices. You know, we're going to have more subjective ranking through facial recognition and voice responses without that bias as well. And there's some AI platforms that can already do that. So overall, more informed and smarter hiring decisions are on the horizon because of AI. And some examples of this, we already use some different intelligent resume tools with high levels of AI to screen candidates. That's in a majority of different hiring tools that are available today. There are some companies who are actually using intelligent chatbots in their hiring process to speed along 
that process where they can communicate and get real time information from the chatbot versus having to deal with an actual HR professional or human resources officer. And then of course, virtual interviews with actual digital avatars. There's a company out there now that actually does this where they create a lifelike human AI virtual avatar that interviews people and it can recognize emotion, interpret speech using objective data analysis. Again, helping to free up time for more important tasks for HR officers and offloading that onto technology. Marketing, huge one here, and one that is near and dear to my heart. So marketing, so much data, right? Especially now with social media, all the different analytics tools that we have available to us are just incredible. But with marketing, we're going to have more personalized messaging even more than we've seen now, because we're going to be removing with these AI powered platforms, the guessing game out of what people want and we're gonna know what they need actually. And I'll be honest, I have received some real interesting Facebook ads over the last couple of weeks that are so detailed to my preferences. It, it just amazes me. Kind of scary, yes, but it, it also piques my curiosity because it really hones in on what I want, which reduces my decision fatigue, which makes me a much happier consumer, which means their marketing is working. And it's going to allow us to invoke a bit more of our creative spirit too, when we can really dive into these analytics and AI can give us insights into these analytics to be able to adjust our creativity more on the marketing side to be able to capture people's attention. So we are, again, we already see examples of this in marketing. Uh, voice assistants are a huge one. The Amazon algorithm, every time you go and shop on Amazon, that algorithm recommends you a set of products that you didn't even know you needed, but you probably buy. I've done that because they're just so spot on. Social media. Every time we use a social media platform, we're engaging with artificial intelligence. I like to remind people of that. And then of course, data visualization and some of these different insight tools to analyze some of these metrics and all of this different campaign data that we have. Some companies are already deploying some high level AI tools to do that at a, at a reasonable cost. So that's how it's going to affect marketing and that's gonna be very big. And then of course we have retail. So, you know, the nature of shopping as we know it is already changing. We're already, you know, retail was already going through a very large shift. It's only going to shift more in light of the pandemic and as we enter this new era of AI. We're already seeing this start to happen and right before our eyes. You know, Amazon has those Amazon Go stores that are cashierless that uses sensors and measurements to actually know when you've purchased a product so you don't even have to check out with the cashier. We have fashion outlets like Stitch Fix that use an intelligent algorithm to determine your style profile and then communicates with an actual stylist to give you clothes that are tailored to your preferences. You know, the use of voice assistants to research products and conduct transactions within seconds that would normally take a couple of minutes or even longer, and then actually learn about that over time to recommend even more personalized products to you is already changing the game. And this is really the future of retail. We think it's on demand now. It's only going to be more on demand and more intelligent when it becomes more on demand. One example I like to refer to is Target actually developed an AI model, I think it was last year, that could predict teenage pregnancy before the teenager actually knew they were pregnant based on their purchasing habits. And it was right. <laughs> Scary, I know, but that's the scope of the data we're dealing with. That is how nitty gritty and niche we can get with it. Um, and again, I draw onto Facebook ads and how hyper-personalized those are. You know, I got an ad, I live in Wisconsin, my mom lives in Illinois, I somehow got an ad with a mug for Mother's Day, it told me to buy for her saying, your son is never too far away from you, showing stars in our respective locations. How did it know that? Hyper-personalized data from all my different profiles. That is the future of retail and we're already experiencing that. And the last um, finance quick before I get into the last one. So better financial security, right? Of course, banking is, a, is an industry that has vulnerabilities all around the board. AI is gonna be able to make that smarter and more managed, more efficient and calculated investments that are actually gonna to lead to more economic growth around the horizon and is really going to automate everything that involves spreadsheets to be able to actually put our brain power to more of the nitty gritty nuts and bolts stuff versus having to just do basic high level things that we shouldn't have been having to do anyhow. So some examples of this already happening in the finance sector, fraud detection, you know, anytime you get a notification about your debit card or credit card or suspicious activity, that is actually an AI that is actually going through all your different transactions and purchase history to determine that. Intelligent blockchain networks, whole other rabbit hole I could go down, but just know that transaction and peer-to-peer -peer transaction is on the way. That's gonna be AI powered with blockchain. 
Then we have customer service. Many finance companies and banking defaulting to intelligent customer service platforms where you're talking to a, you know, a robot on the other end that sounds lifelike, but it allows them to reduce operational costs and provide you with a better experience. So this is just a summation of how that's even impacting finance. And last but not least here, even of course the tech sector. So, you know, we think of how can technology, you know, the tech industry that's generating artificial intelligence, how can that be impacted by it? Well, I think this one really speaks for itself. You know, AI is impacting the technology industry more than I think all the other industries combined because it's at the center of everything they're doing. It's at the center of every product. It's at the center of every service. It's, you know, Microsoft has said it's a part of our future. Apple said it's a part of our future. Of course, Amazon has ingrained that into their DNA as a company. It's at the core of everything that they're doing. So if you look at even some of the hardware of this, many smartphones today are powered by intelligent chips. The iPhone is powered by a machine learning chip. You know, we have cloud computing AI tools and AWS, Azure and Google Cloud that the companies are letting us use at reduced cost because they know that that's going to be a part of the fabric of everything that not only they do, but that everybody else does as well. And then of course, the internet of things with all of our different devices made by the technology industry, reporting back data in real time to allow us to develop these models more effectively. So that is how the tech industry itself is being impacted. So AI is impacting everyone. Hopefully that came across enough with all those different industries that I just dove into there, but it is impacting everyone. It's going to change everything on a global scale. It already is. COVID-19 has only accelerated that. And the scope of what it means to be human as we head into this next era of AI is going to change drastically. There are going to be a lot of ethical considerations. There are going to be a lot of socioeconomic impacts, societal things. We're going to have to adjust everything that we've known to meet this new future of AI and automation. And I think when the scope of our work changes, when we can finally offload all these different mundane, menial tasks onto AI, onto robots, onto automation, I think we'll finally be brought back to our roots and we're going to go another, we're going to undergo a creative renaissance period unlike anything that we've ever dealt with before. And I'm talking art, literature, film, because we're gonna be able to focus more of our attention on these different aspects of our humanity. So one statistic that I always like to show here, and this was issued by Dell in 2017, is that 85% of jobs that will exist in 2030 haven't been invented yet. Now, by 2022, which of course is now about a year and a half away, AI is expected to create 133 million new roles. Are we still on track for that? I'm not entirely certain. It all depends on how the rest of this year shapes up and how many more companies decide to onboard some of these different tools. But that's what the prediction is. Now, it'll create 133 million new roles, but also could cause 75 million jobs to be displaced. Displaced, not eliminated. Again, there'll be new job growth. It'll be augmented. We will have to adapt. But if you look at that statistic, AI could create a net new 58 million jobs in the next few years. That's a lot. And I think we're going to need that, especially as we're now facing record unemployment and different roles for people need to be created that technology can help fuel. And we're on track for that. So this is how to prepare. The culmination of everything I've talked about, this is how you are going to prepare. So first and foremost, embrace technology. I think that is just a given. If you are somebody sitting in this webinar right now, either in your personal life or for your organization, and you just really fully haven't embraced technology yet, now is the time. Should have been the time about five, 10 years ago. It really is the time now. You need to embrace technology, play with it, understand it, learn it, embrace it. Educate yourself and your team. This is one of the most important to-dos or how you can prepare now is education, educating yourself and your team about the different tools out there that are available. Again, you don't need to become Albert Einstein about artificial intelligence, but you need to understand what it is, how it works and how you can apply it to your business because at some point you will be asked about it. Even if you're not a decision maker, it will trickle down and it will affect you at some point. So the more educated you can be and the more your team can be educated, the better off you're gonna be when your organization does start onboarding more of these AI tools. Identify simple problems. I think this is the big holdup for a lot of people is when we look at a new technology, we think it's so overwhelming, it's so over ahead, how could we actually fit this into our organization? 
Well, the thing is you need to break down and identify simple problems because we have this habit of onboarding new technology, new software as a service platforms, thinking that it's going to be the end all be all of this gargantuan problem we have. Then it doesn't solve the problem and we write it off and tuck it away and say it was the platform's fault. No, especially with something like AI, it needs to solve a problem. So identifying the simple problems first, onboarding the technology, fixing the problem, you can then scale up from there. Learn to code. I'm not saying become a master programmer, but just the basics, just a basic understanding of C Sharp, C++, JavaScript, Python, all of these different computer languages. There is a flavor for everybody. You don't need to be a master at it, but just understand the basics because the real value, again, as we head into this AI powered world, is people are still gonna need to manipulate the computers and work alongside them. And if you know how to do that, your value is going to increase 10X. And to close it off here, strengthen your EQ. You know, emotional intelligence is something that I am still shocked is very underrated in the world of work today. But to me, it is gonna be the most important thing and should be the most important thing, especially when everything is automated. One of the real value is going to be how you perceive the world, how you attack problems, how you critically think, how you can leverage your EQ to conduct business and build relationships more effectively. So strengthening your EQ now and recognizing how you can improve upon that is going to help you and your organization succeed moving forward. So what does this all mean? As I've gone through, you know, so much different stuff in this last hour here. Well, in the future, sooner than we all think, machines will replace human jobs. That is a fact. It is a certainty. And this is what machines have done, though, since before the start of the Industrial Revolution. You know, think about when we were an ag-based society, what the Industrial Revolution did with some of these different tools to help us automate even our ag culture. It's the same exact thing, just a different time period. Now, sometime within the next 30 years, when computing power is a million X of what is available today based on Moore's law, we're going to encounter an economic singularity. What is an economic singularity? Well, an economic singularity or the economic singularity, which was coined by computer pioneer John von Neumann, um, is when humanity approaches some essential point in our history of our race beyond which human affairs, as we've known them, could not continue. Because think about it, if we get to a point where AI runs all of the jobs, automation runs our world of work, what are we going to do? How are we going to generate wealth? What does that look like for socioeconomics? All these different things. That is what the economic singularity is. Now, from the time, from the time being, as machines replace different human jobs, we're going to be subject to the complementary effect. This won't last forever, but it will, it will last probably for the next 10, 15, maybe 20 years. So what the complementary effect is, is when a human job is automated, the amount of wealth by an economy increases, right? But this isn't going to last forever. And we're going to reach a point where when AI does everything and when automation does everything, how are we going to, 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 to keep income going? What is income going to look like? What jobs are we going to put people in? And a lot of people don't agree with me when I say this, but protecting jobs is also not the answer. Protecting jobs actually stifles innovation. It, it stifles economic efficiency, competitiveness, and economic growth. Because again, technology is meant to improve the process, make things more efficient, create wealth. If we're constantly protecting what's old, that is only going to put us behind. And protecting jobs statistically increases economic disparity and actually makes everyone poorer in the long run. This is fact. I can send you the study I found this from. But just start ch challenging your thinking about that. Yes, we want to protect jobs, but let's protect the new ones we don't even exist yet that are going to give so much more opportunity to someone than the same job that we've had for the past 50 years. So now is the time to learn. Learning, updating, and retooling your skills that will help you remain valuable as we enter this next normal. So with all that being said, welcome to the next normal. Right now is the most uncertain period that we've been in in many, many decades. And we're, we're going through this global pandemic, of course. We're going through one of the most powerful social justice movements since the 1960s. Something is happening. It's a period of change. It's a period of uncertainty. But this is when the most brilliance tends to shine. 
And this is really going to set the stage for this new world of work and a new way of doing things that is going to open up so much opportunity, I can't even quantify it because it's going to be so gargantuan. Now, of course, with every change like this, there's going to be winners, there's going to be losers, but the winners will be those who choose to adapt and embrace new technologies like artificial intelligence. Adaptation is key here if you want to survive. And I have an extremely optimistic outlook that we'll get through this. We always get through things like this, but technology is going to empower us to achieve even greater outcomes, especially artificial intelligence. So these technologies are the future, and in order to stay ahead and competitive, it's best to start learning about them today. You have no time to waste. So that is my talk. And to close here, um, if you're interested in learning more about emerging technology, AI, voice technology, and the impact that it's having all around the world, I do run a weekly podcast series called The Artificial Podcast. I interview amazing folks globally that share some amazing insight. That QR code will take you right to that. A little bit of self-promotion, we recently onboarded a new service called Blue Fox Box that allows you to order your groceries via voice in a pre-packaged box delivered right to your door. To learn more, check that out. And then connect with me. I'm on all the social media platforms, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, there's my email, uh, as well as our website. That QR code there will actually take you to our Red Fox AI Alexa skill where you can learn more about our company as well as about us as well and get some digital business cards. And with that, I say stay hungry, stay foolish, stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, tremendous presentation and um, I'm sure everybody learned a lot. <laughs> I, I can't help but believe they did. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions and I invite people to, you know, chime in through chat. Um, you know, when you think about, there are aspects, and you touched on this, about AI that some people could just see as flat out creepy, right? right? I mean, they're, they're out there. I mean, whether it's, the, you know, the marketing side or uh, security threats, you know, I have to believe that some of the controversy around TikTok, for example, yep. is, is driven by the AI there. Um, the notion of uh, can AI in human resources take on biases that are unintended that perhaps the rest of us have. Um, talk about that a little bit and, and how we're gonna work through that as, as humans. I mean, it's, the potential is enormous as you just described, but there are some pieces that probably still have to be figured out. So if you could spend a little bit of time on that. Yeah, that's a really good question, Tom. And I think one of the biggest things that has really started to be talked about in the AI community, um, Brookings Institute, MIT, a lot of big players are really starting to pull apart the ethics of artificial intelligence. And uh, especially in Europe, we're seeing some money being poured into some different organizations that are trying to figure out how we can, how we can evolve this technology that is so life-changing to avoid bias, to avoid some of these things that we've been dealing with as a, as a species for so long, because it is going to be so transformational. I think a lot of important questions have to be asked. There needs to be government support behind this as well. But I think the biggest challenge that we have to fully implementing this in the way that we need to is the ethics side. And then, of course, you brought up the point, you know, we look at something like TikTok and, and the data side of that. I mean, data privacy and security has been a topic of conversation as long as I can remember. And of course, one of the, one of the things that's interesting about that is everybody kind of has their own stake in data privacy, right? You know, and I think that's what, you know, we, GDPR and CCPA and some of those regulations were a good first step, but the real work has to be done with the tech companies. Um, of course, they will say that oh yes, we believe in data security, data privacy, all this stuff. But if you look under the covers, not much has really been done outside of what they actually need to do on a basic level to ensure that data is secure and data is private. A lot of people actually approach me after I give some of these talks and think, oh, well, you must be okay with all of our data just being collected and used without us knowing. No, I'm actually completely anti that. But at the same time, We've evolved to the point where it's become so normal in our lives that it's something we just have to accept. But at the same time, 
that does not give us a right to just sit there and accept that. One of the organizations I'm involved with right now called the Open Voice Network, we're actively working on privacy and security with voice technology specifically and coming up with a position paper or recommendations or standards that we can post to say, when you're creating an AI powered voice application, here's what needs to be done to ensure the data security and privacy of what you're collecting on your customers or users. So I think I may have gone off on a tangent there, but I, I think at the end of the day, when we look at the grand scope of AI, ethics is going to be at the center of all of this. And these discussions need to happen now. And I, I, as, as we look at government today, some things need to change there. Some more of their focus is on this because this will blindside them and it, the other end will not be good if it does blindside them. Yeah. Well, almost in, on cue, we have a, have a question that, that takes it into this uh, direction. Ooh, fantastic. Yeah, with <laughs> us today is uh, Jason Fields. Jason's a state representative out of Milwaukee, uh, also the founder of Dark Knight uh, Venture Cabin, and uh, someone who's just been a really a good friend of the tech community and the economic community in Wisconsin overall. And he, he says he, you know, he appreciates this presentation. As an elected official, he took an online course via Stanford University to get a certificate for AI learning. From a policy point of view, what can elected officials like like Jason and many others do to quell the fear about AI and move us into the future. So it, it really segues into where you were just yeah. a minute ago. I think the starting point is talking about it. You know, right now the discussion is centered more or less from the media. And of course the media tends to frame anything they can get their hands on again within a certain set of parameters is not necessarily having the best connotation. And I'll be honest, most of the news that I've seen about AI has only been the scary stuff. It's not been any of the good things that AI is doing. So on the political level, if politics can come together and start having some of these open discussions with constituencies and the general public about what do you think AI is? How can we better help educate you and give you the knowledge you need as a member of the general public to understand this technology and how it's going to impact you. Because the fear comes from not knowing. The fear comes from thinking that it's in a black box and there's, you know, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain kind of finagling everything. Well, of course, as we know, and as I've talked about here, that could be farther from the truth. But I think opening up the discussion in a comfortable setting for people so they can vent their fears, vent their frustrations, you bring in folks on the political level who have knowledge in some of these technologies, or even you use external sources, whether those be scientists, professors, and you assemble them and you have some of these different discussions publicly. And that's gonna transcend, I think, so many different avenues and I think really make people feel more comfortable with this. And I, I think that's just been the biggest holdback. It's just not talked about publicly enough. And again, we're dealing with a couple of things right now, right? But you know, I think beyond that, this discussion really needs to start taking place and it needs to start coming from politics. And you know, related to that, and you touched on this during your presentation, um, one of those fears that may be out there is that AI and and maybe some offshoots of that robotics will destroy jobs versus create them. You cited mm -hmm. statistics that show the opposite. And, and in fact, um, as you noted, if we worry too much about protecting jobs, we can stifle innovation. Yep. And let's, let's worry more about protecting those jobs that are yet to be born in a sense. Right. Um, how can, how can public policy and public officials address that fear? Because, you know, there are a lot of people out there right now, of course, without a job. And right. They, they may be tempted to think that it's only going to get worse. Right. Your well, that's a good question. And, you know, honestly, that's kind of a catch-22 right now, right? Because, you know, I say that, you know, we can't solely focus on protecting jobs that we've had because that's going to stifle innovation from creating new jobs. But it's hard to tell that to somebody and give them comfort when the new job doesn't exist yet. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a catch-22. But you know, I'm trying to think of a good answer to this question, and, and maybe I don't have an answer, but I think, again, it, it falls back on the education. And I think if the picture can be painted well enough to people who currently are unemployed right now, or people who just generally think that technology is going out about anything and, and just helping educate them and show them that this is what's possible, if we all work together, we all understand it, and we all implement it correctly, 
this is what's possible. This is how things are going to boom. This is how the wealth is going to be created. And I think that could change the tone of it. But specifically, you know, talking to, to Joe Smith, who's unemployed right now, saying, oh, we don't need to worry about your job because we're trying to create innovation for artificial intelligence to come and automate and create wealth. It's just hard to explain and maybe not the right thing to do now. But I think starting small and having some of the smaller discussions is probably the best way to approach it because it is a catch-22 and it is going to happen regardless. These jobs are going to get created at some point as more automation takes hold. It's just a matter of when. And, and, and of course, education, you've re referenced that broadly and specifically. For people who perhaps in the past didn't see as much value in education, whether it's general education, tech education, whatever it might have been, vocational education, is AI going to make whatever type of education it is more important in the future? Are you, are you talking about a specific type of education, a specific yeah. subject, or just broadly? I think just broadly. I mean, it yeah. can be in, in any of those sectors, it seems to me. But, you know, whether it's vocational education that you might receive through one of Wisconsin's fine technical colleges or, or uh, simply making sure you have a high school degree and, you know, yeah. all those kinds of pieces and how they fit together. Yeah, I think, you know, as we enter this new world where, where AI begins to automate more things, you know, we look at the education system that we've had for, you know, who knows how long. And the whole purpose of the education system, as I see it, again, this is just my opinion to be wrong, is to prepare you for a career in the working world. But if we're looking at a future where careers don't necessarily exist because a majority of jobs are automated, how does that impact the education system? So that's where I think it's actually going to start. Um, we're going to start seeing a transformation where schools and tech colleges and different things may not necessarily focus more on say like, you know, you have your accounting class or you have your, you know, your, your, business development class, I'm just, I'm speaking generally here, but I, I think it's going to, to maybe shift a bit more towards the, and, and you may be surprised to say this, the philosophical mm -hmm. teachings, the creative thinking, the critical thinking, because if the AI is doing all of these, you know, jobs that you can be trained to do from tech schools or even collegiate universities, what is the value still going to be? Well, the value is still going to be that critical thinking that we have as humans that we always should be working on improving to make the technology itself better. You know, I, you know, we're still going to figure out how to get out of our own solar system. The AI is going to help us. But we're going to be the ones who figure that out ultimately, I think. Um, but we just need the critical thinking skills and the technology at our disposal to even be able to come up with something like that. So that's how I think the education system is probably going to change. Not to mention, I think it's going to work in tandem with some of these new tools. We already are seeing that now, of course, with remote and e-learning going on. I mean, even before then, all of my cousins had Google Chromebooks that were issued to them by the school that they were using to complete assignments and different things. I could honestly see there being an augmentation between a teacher helping students, and then maybe you have an on-demand AI assistant or chatbot that could ask, you know, you could ask questions to, receive information, do some other basic stuff that you would otherwise have to go to the teacher for. So those are just some different things that I can kind of first see how that's going to affect the education system. But that one is really an open book. Um, that one, that one's going to be a, mm -hmm. an interesting discussion. Very good. Well, we have, uh, we've gone over a little bit. <laughs> that's great. And it's, and, and I think we've, We've uh, held those who have been on just because of how interesting it has been. So thank you, Nick. I really encourage people to, you know, take a look at, uh, at Nick's uh, podcast and some of the other things that he can offer. And uh, uh, this is recorded. And so uh, for those who are on and want to, you know, want to see that and review some of that information, uh, that's great. Uh, Jim Hartley and First Business Bank, thank you so much for, for sponsoring today. And I'm sure you're going to run out and start making some of those changes that uh, in the financing industry that, that Nick just uh, just talked about. Starting so, tomorrow, right? Starting tomorrow. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, very good. So um, coming up, uh, we're going to have a presentation on July 28th, 1 o'clock, featuring uh, people, some of the experts at Epic, Exact Sciences, and Promega which have been working together in a couple of different platforms as they have been 
a part of the solution or trying to be a part of the solution around COVID-19. Uh, so I think this, um, you know, these are excellent resources here in Wisconsin. And the fact that they've come together around it, I think speaks a lot for not only our culture, but the level of expertise that we do have in this state. So thank you all for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate it. Nick, again, as always, great seeing you and I never fail, fail to learn something. Listen. <laughs> no, thank you again so much for having me, Tom. It, it's been my pleasure. I, as you know, I love just diving into all this. It fascinates me. So. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. All right. Well, thanks to everyone. And uh, we'll hopefully see you all again soon. Take care.